people okay now is on so I will restart so good afternoon everybody please take your seats uh, well as fast as you can because we're ready the time to start our closing session of the ACM Europe conference so Okay, let's try to gain some time. Uh, so, um, after the, uh, the cyber event track we had yesterday with our Turing lecture by Silvio and uh, the cybersecurity panel, today we continue on an equally high level. It's interesting to speak where people are moving, like speaking in an airport lounge. Okay, anyway. Um, so we will start uh, the, the program of this afternoon with our keynote speech by Professor Kathy Yellick from Berkeley. And uh, I want to, well, she's very well known, so she doesn't really need uh, an introduction, but just for, uh, just for the good form, let me say a few words about her. So she is an Associate Laboratory Director for Computer Science at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, where she oversees the National Energy Research Scientific Computer Center, NERSC, the Energy Science Network, ESNet, and the Computational Research Division. She is also a Professor of Electric Engineering and computer science at the University of California in Berkeley. Her research interests include parallel programming, languages, automatic performance tuning, performance analysis, parallel algorithms, and optimizing compilers. Yelik is an ACM fellow and recipient of the ACM IEEE Kennedy Ken Kennedy Award and the ACM W Athena Award. So Kathy, please come to the podium. Don't <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, this is my first time in Barcelona and actually my first time in Spain. Uh, so it's a lovely city and uh, a lovely campus here. Um, this is a picture of the uh, Berkeley campus. Actually, this is taken from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is about a 15 minute walk up a fairly steep hill uh, to get to the Computing Sciences Building, which is the building where most of, where our supercomputers are and most of my staff are. Um, and, but down below, you can see the uh, Campanile, which is the center of the Berkeley campus. So I think it's always useful um, when you hear someone speak to hear a little bit about their biases and perspective. So um, just to emphasize something that um, was already said, uh, part of one of the things that I run at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab is the um, NERSC Center, National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center, um, which is a Department of Energy um, center in the U.S. for that serves the Office of Science in the Department of Energy. So it does only um, scientific, open scientific research, um, delivers state-of-the-art computing facilities, um, but it has a very broad user base. So about 7,000 users, so a lot more users than many supercomputing centers. Um, and about 700 applications. And what that means is um, we have a very difficult time in, in trying to deliver state-of-the-art computing to this type of community because uh, they have a very diverse set of applications and each one of them has to be modified if we're going to significantly change the architecture. And of course, that's one of the things that we're facing as we look at Exascale. Um, and our goal at Berkeley Lab is to really produce the maximum science input po possible with exascale computing, and part of that means delivering a system eventually um, to the NERSC um, Center, although we won't be getting one of the first um, super exascale systems in the U.S. <clears throat> So I'm going to start with a statement of hypothesis, which is that exascale computing combined with state-of-the-art mathematical models, algorithms, and software techniques will enable breakthrough science. This is essentially the title of my talk, but I wanted to qualify it and say 
Exascale computers by themselves are not going to deliver breakthrough science. The breakthrough science will come from advances that are made in the applications, completely new applications that we hadn't even created before, or from adding new capabilities to existing applications, and all of those will require new ma um, that we use the best mathematics available, typically mathematical techniques that have been developed over the last decade, um, uh, as well as algorithms and um, computer science techniques, including better programming. <clears throat> so I think that the applications of Exascale are going to include data and simulation applications. Um, this is a picture of some of the main applications that um, we are working on for Exascale. Most of them are part of the DOE Exascale Computing Project. There are others that are not listed here as well, um, but I sort of divided them into problems that are predominantly simulation, such as cosmology and astrophysics, accelerator modeling, carbon capture simulations, uh, materials and chemistry simulations, and, and more. And then on the left-hand side, I think that are, are dominated more by uh, data analysis, which includes deep learning for cancer research, um, climate analysis, so analysis of actually of simulation data, uh, genomic analysis, transportation, urban systems, uh, sim uh, analyzing brain data, and other environmental data. And I've sort of arbitrarily, in some cases, put one of these on one side or the other. And the point, the main point I want to make about this is that most of these applications, when you actually look at solving a science problem, are not strictly simulation or strictly data. There's observational data. Um, there's simulations that help you understand and interpret the data. <clears throat> and you use the observational data to improve the quality of simulations and also to help you understand the observational data. So although I've, I've drawn it as sort of two sides of this, this slide, I think what we will see is many scientific breakthroughs are going to happen right at the boundary of simulation and observation or simulation and data. So some of the challenges that come up um, from these specifically um, in the scientific domains are things like improving the resolution, so making, having more detailed simulations. That's sort of one of the obvious things that we can talk about with, with faster computers, larger memory systems, that we can get higher resolution simulations. On the data side, um, of course, being able to handle larger data sets, so data size is one of the important things that we'll see from exascale computing. But equally important in terms of actually delivering new science are things like adding multi-physics, so taking two different physical models and combining them together, or multi-scale, having to to simulate across multiple scales and propagate information from very detailed, say, chemical level models up to some more of a structural model. On the data side, there are similar, um, th there are similar challenges that are not necessarily just related to the size of the data. Um, we talk about big data as, a, as if the main challenge is the size of the data, but it's also about the complexity of the data. So very complicated data sets that come from um, different sources, and then multimodal data, which is sort of the data analog of multiphysics, that is data that comes from different sources, such as genomic data, combined with imaging data, and combined with other kinds of, say, um, phenotype data, clinical data, or other things in order to solve problems. Now, Historically, our high-performance systems have been used for simulation, um, but one of the reasons that we're in going to increasingly see that these, these exascale systems and other HPC systems will have to be used for data analysis is because of a fundamental um, difference in where computing is going and where um, the detectors and the, the, the data collection devices. So most people in, in computer science are familiar with things like the Internet of Things argument that everybody's got their cell phones, um, everybody's got their sensors embedded in your houses and all over the place that are producing data. But even when you look at large scientific instruments, there's still a gap between the speed at which um, those, the detectors, the things that are collecting data inside of, say, the Large Hadron Collider or the telescopes, are the rate at which they're collecting data and the, the, the size of that data um, and the, the size of computing. So the two top lines here are data collection techniques, detectors, and then genome sequencers, which are also have notoriously grown. The, the ability to sequence um, data has, has grown much faster than um, processing technology. The bottom two lines there, are processor and memory, that's, by the way, the old Moore's Law line for processor. And as we will, I'll talk about later, of course, that is slowing down. Um, and is going to run out soon. Um, and, and you might say, well, we don't really care about processing speed because these are data problems, but of course memory performance has, has scaled even more slowly than processor performance. 
So um, what are some of the advanced mathematic and, and mathematics and computer science that we're going to need to maximize the scientific capabilities of Exascale? Um, these are some of the applications we're working on at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, and I won't read through each one of these, but we tried to, I tried to just capture here a little bit about the science challenge that's associated with each one of them. So all of the Exascale projects within the DOE um, Exascale Computing Program have uh, have a um, science challenge, at least one science challenge, and in many cases, multiple science challenges that they are planning to solve um, in developing a, an exascale version of their code that will run on the future exascale machines. So for example, um, in accelerator modeling, we're trying to um, simulate a 1 TeV electron positon collider. It's actually 100 stages in that simulation. Um, and I'll talk about some of these uh, a little bit more, but I just want to point out that each one of these does have a, a specific ch science challenge. Now, what are the mathematics and computer science challenges associated with them? Well, within the, the applications that we're working at, on at the lab, six of them actually involve adaptive mesh refinement. <clears throat> what that means is that you want finer and finer resolution, as I talked about before. So you want to put a finer mesh, for example, right around where the ice is melting in Antarctica to figure out exactly what's going to happen, um, how quickly that ice sheet is going to shear off. Um, but you're, you put finer resolution there and coarser resolution um, in other parts of the simulation where things that are, no, nothing as complicated is happening. And so that's a, a technique that's been developed over the last couple of decades that is something that is being used in all of these um, exascale applications that we have. Um, on the other hand, um, solvers, linear solvers, are going to come up in a number of the different application domains. I've shown some of them there. And, um, and in this case, uh, techniques that allow you to have not just dense linear solvers, which of course is behind the, the LINPAC benchmark, but typically in most of these applications at scale, you're going to be running sparse solvers. Um, and so using the best techniques for solving sparse linear equations will be uh, very important as well. I haven't really shown here the computer science techniques underneath both of these, um, but the ability to, um, to, to program them in a way that allows these fairly complicated algorithms, these adaptive and sparse algorithms on the hardware system is going to be something that requires a more sophisticated computer science. So let me ta start by talking about one science example in a little bit of detail, um, and that is cosmology. So um, this is a... Uh, the, the goal of the Exascale Cosmology Project, which is led by Salman Habib at Argonne National Lab, um, is to uh, be able to model and interpret the latest observational data that's coming from the telescopes and, and uh, uh, that, that are collecting data from um, a number of different scientific um, instruments. So on the left-hand side, you see a simulation, a synthetic galaxy catalog that will be, that's associated with the LSST experiment um, done with one of um, Salman's code called HACK. Um, on the right-hand side is a simulation of the Lyman Alpha Forest um, using another code developed at Berkeley Lab with adaptive mesh refinement called NIX. And this is used to estimate some more details of the simulation, such as the neutrino mass. So the code on the left gives you much larger scale simulations in terms of the size of the universe. Um, the, the code on the right gives you more detail. Um, so we, they want to use this, the, the, the physicists want to use these kinds of simulation codes to understand a number of different characteristics of um, of a physical constant, such as the Hubble constant, and other uh, various characteristics of physics. So this is just um, quickly a look at some of the different experimental devices that the community is putting together or ha is planning to, to launch. Um, so these are different surveys of the sky. So there's LSST on the right. There's DES and CMBS3, which are active now. Um, and I won't go through the details of this except to say in the middle what you see are the simulation requirements. And consistently what is happening, the, cons the, the simulations are being used for a number of reasons. One of them is to, to test out the data analysis before the simulation, before the experiment is launched. Another thing is to help you interpret the data. For example, be, you may be looking at, um, you're looking at the, the sky, but you can't actually see things beh behind the Milky Way galaxy because the Milky Way is too bright. And so you're trying to fill in inf missing information with the simulation. And in general, you're trying to use the simulations to interpret what you're seen in the observation, so you don't just have a specific observation, but you actually have a theory, a model that you can simulate that matches that observational data. So in terms of what the simulations need to do, right, today we have very large-scale n-body um, simulations that simulates gravity. Um, we, don't, we have sort of medium-scale hydrodynamic simulations and what are called subgrid models, so much more detailed models that go down below the level of the mesh that, that is being refined in the simulations. As you go to the future experiments, um, you're going to need much larger scale hydrodynamics and much better subgrid models. And when you get to the, the um, 
the exascale era of observation, you're going to need extreme scale simulations for both the, the end body and the hydrodynamics, as well as very complex subgrid models. And this kind of gives you an idea of the size of the systems that you'll need in each of those. So what's the science breakthrough? Well, I'm gonna go back and look at a previous science breakthrough to talk about this a little bit. So this is a picture of Saul Perlmutter, who's a Nobel laureate um, at both UC Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Um, and his Nobel Prize is for understanding the expansion, the accelerating expansion of the universe. So how does he do this? Well, he actually used the computers at NERSC, um, and he's looking for things called type 1a supernovas, and you don't read to, need to know the details of what they are, except that they, are, they can be used as standard candles. So they're exploding stars, and if you can find them exploding, you can use that as sort of a measurement point in the universe. And so one of the things that he does is to search for supernova. And they actually used to do this manually by sifting through all of the data, and they now use sophisticated machine learning algorithms that automatically detect this and allow them, for example, they, they sort of pages a scientist and says, I think we found a supernova. In some cases, they'll, they'll turn the telescopes worldwide to, to look at that supernova. Okay, so he, he had this discovery about the accelerating um, expansion of the universe. Um, but what is it? We're, we're now trying to understand exactly what is this, that, that rate, and so some, uh, what is the rate of expansion, and so we need a little bit more detailed data. So it turns out that um, there's, a, there's an effect in physics, um, which is called lensing, which gravitational lensing, and this is just sort of an a, a artist rendering of it that shows when there's something that you're looking at that's in a far distance away, um, you're sitting here at Earth, if there's a galaxy in between you and the thing that you're looking at, you may be able to see it because the, the, the light actually bends around um, the, the thing that's in the middle. And so, in particular, what we're going to do is look for supernova that have this particular lens characteristic. We're going to look for things that have been, have, where the light uh, from the supernova has been bent around some kind of an intermediate galaxy. There was a recent discovery of one of these, which was the first type 1a supernova um, in one of these lens configurations. Um, and that was done also using this pipeline that I mentioned before, running this machine learning algorithms at NERSC and so on. Um, but what they discovered was that it was actually much further away than they initially thought. It was four billion light years away rather than only about a billion light years away. And the reason they were able to see it, and actually it turned out they, they saw multiple copies of it, was because of this lensing effect. And so what you see over there on the right, this little blob here, um, if you can see that, there's actually multiple copies. The blue thing in the middle is the galaxy um, that is actually performing the lensing. Okay, so now what we need to do is very detailed simulations that will allow us to try to figure out exactly how, what speed the light is coming around um, and, and the difference between the arrival times of the different images of that, um, and it allows us to get much better accuracy on things like the Hubble constant. A second exascale application, um, which is related to this problem, is, is an astrophysics simulation. And for many of you, that may sound like the same thing, but this is actually looking down inside of a, something such as a star and exactly how that's exploding. So these are pictures of a um, su uh, exploding say, um, supernova. And um, one of the questions that comes up, if you're going to use these supernovas as, as uh, um, me measurement devices in the sky, you care about exactly the way in which they, expo they explode, and you also care about exactly what happens as their images is, is lensed around a galaxy. So already we understand a lot about explosion, and this is using, uh, once again, an adaptive mesh refinement code, um, but what, we're, what they're planning to do in, in exascale, among other things, such as trying to use them to identify the source of the heaviest elements in the universe, is also to get an understanding of what this lensing effect will actually look like, which allows them to refine their models and then interpret the observational data more clearly. So that's a somewhat detailed discussion about how simulation fits with observation in this area of cosmology and astrophysics to, to answer fundamental questions about um, things like the expansion of the universe. Okay, so a little bit closer to home. So here's another problem that's part of the Exascale project is subsurface science. Um, this is looking at the problem of um, understanding what's happening beneath the surface of the Earth um, when you're doing things like um, drilling for geothermal energy, drilling for a traditional um, sorts of energy sources, using things, techniques such as fracking, um, or you're trying to store waste such as carbon sequestration, or you're trying to store um, nuclear uh, waste. And so the question is, what happens after, say, 100 years 
um, of, of either storing something or pumping something out of the ground, and it turns out that it's a very complex simulation because things happen at the chemical scale, at sort of a, a pore scale where you've got, this, you've got this porous material, which is why you're either able to extract the oil from the ground or you're able to pump carbon or something into the ground. So you have these very porous sort of material that you're pumping things into, and there's also very gross sort of mechanical level structures that are happening. So this simulation, which is led by um, Carl Stiefel at, at Berkeley Lab. Um, it has these multi, multiple scales as which it's doing the simulations, looking at the pore scale all the way up to the reservoir scale. This is a very complicated software problem in addition to a complicated mathematical problem to figure out how you get the different simulations to talk to one another. So for example, the, the top two pictures here are looking at the flow um, of uh, chemical erosion. Um, that are in a, in a fracture, and so um, this is using a code called Chombo Crunch, which is another one of these adaptive mesh refinement codes. Uh, the slightly lower picture is what happens after um, some number, several hours of the flow going through that, and you can see there's deterioration and things are, are changing. Um, the second code is another code called GEOS, which is a much coarser scale code. It's looking more at the mechanical level, and you want to put these two things together, which they, they've recently done in a combined model. So the next example I'll talk about a little bit is cancer analytics, um, and this is a project led by Rick Stevens at Argonne National Lab. Um, so they're looking at large-scale data analysis as well as simulation to try to get a better understanding of cancer and also to develop treatments that are really targeted to individuals, so precision medicine. Um, the picture on the left is a metastatic cancer um, classification, so you can, by looking at images, classify cancers in different ways, um, but they also want to tie that then to the genetic back background of the patient, um, so you combine the specifics of, say, their cancer images um, to their, the details of their, their genetic history. Um, the middle picture is um, looking at something called a RAS um, gene mutations, and about a third of cancers are caused by these RAS uh, mutations. A group at Livermore is looking at simulations um, to try to identify drugs that will really um, will, will, um, fit with these RAS genes and then, then stop them from uh, propagating. Uh, their, the, uh, the, and stop them from dividing, because when, what happens with these RAS genes is they actually divide very quickly, and that's part of the, the problem um, that you have with these cancer cells. One of the other challenges with cancer, if, if you look at it from the genomic level, is that an, as a cancer a tumor grows, each one of the cells in there, or at least, uh, they don't necessarily all have the same genome. So they start with something that looks like the human genome the, in, of the host, but they will adapt over time, and that makes it much more difficult to target medication to the cancer because um, one part of the tumor may be susceptible to a particular drug, but another part may not be. Um, and so when you look at all these different genomic features, um, you get this combinatorial explosion, and that's one of the other reasons that they need very large-scale computing, including 100 petascale or exascale computers. So that they really need the exascale for these cell-specific interventions, um, and they're using it also to combine all these different types of information together, this kind of multimodal analysis that I mentioned before. So there's three pieces of the project. The project call, is called CANDLE, um, and the focus in that project in terms of the main piece of, of work, especially that, that's being done at Argonne, is on deep learning, and is applying deep learning algorithms to this, um, these biological cancer data sets. Um, there, uh, and there, but there are also molecular simulations that are being used, for example, in the RAS pathways where you're looking for particular molecular structures and how to target drugs to those. Um, and there's supervised learning as well as um, semi-supervised learning algorithms that are being used as well. So in this case, you're looking at very large-scale data sets and very large-scale machine learning techniques. Um, they have scaled some of these machine learning techniques up to hundreds of, of um, processors on the, um, um, as part of this particular project. Um, as kind of an aside, which is not an exascale um, computing project for, that's part of the formal ECP project in the U.S., is um, looking, though, at these deep learning algorithms at a little bit larger scale. This is some work done by um, somebody at NERSC, um, Prabhat, as well as a number of collaborators from um, Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal, as well as Microsoft. And this is looking at um, using deep learning techniques to identify hurricanes um, in climate simulation data. 
Okay, so you've got, let's say, 100 years of climate simulation data, and the way this works is you may run multiple simulations for 100 years because you're running what are called ensembles to try to gain confidence over the predictions that you're making about, for example, will the number of hurricanes increase if there's global, if the, if the Earth warms by two degrees, and will the intensity of those hurricanes increase? Of course, something that's of very, uh, very, very direct interest right now in the U.S., although this is looking at kind of the statistical properties of hurricanes, um, not a specific hurricane simulation. And the deep learning algorithms are used to identify these hurricanes because if you're looking at, say, 20 simulations, each of which want, runs for 100 years, it's very tedious to just sort of watch the visualizations of each of those simulations and count the hurricanes. So this is using um, machine learning to actually not just um, do pattern matching, but eventually to, to actually identify patterns automatically of extreme climate events. And the, the green boxes are the, the true um, events, and the red ones are the predictions. Um, and this was run at uh, 15 petaflops on the NERSC system, uh, the Cori system, which is the one I showed a picture of earlier. Um, it's a Cray system with Intel Knight's Landing processors on it, so it's running on 9,600 nodes. So you can see this is a large-scale machine learning problem. It does make effective use even of current petascale. This is a, about a 30 petaflop peak machine. Um, and are, is something that's approaching what we will need um, for exascale and even larger data sets. The next example is also related to genomics. Um, this is actually my own project as part of the, as one of the exascale projects. And the problem is to try to um, do geno genomic science, but not for humans, um, but looking at environmental genomes. And um, the environmental genomes, so this is a very a sort of messy looking um, microbial mat in a piece of, in Yellowstone National Park in the U.S. in the, in a, uh, the guy, West Thumb Geyser Basin. So what you see in all those different color are all these different microbes that are growing um, in there. Each one of these are different species. Um, they interact with one another and they, um, and they have a lot of diversity. Um, on the right-hand side is a picture from um, some work that Jill Banfield, who's at both UC Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley Lab, did um, in a, uh, collecting data from um, an area called the Crystal Geyser Basin, and this is looking at bacteria. It turns out that she's discovered a much more compact way of, of gene editing, doing gene editing, so a CRISPR system, um, but not Cas9, um, that, that occurred naturally in this um, bacterial environment. So um, what do we need to do at an exascale to try to understand these microbial communities that live in natural environments like this? Well, the first thing to keep in mind is that unlike the human genome, um, we don't have a reference for most of these. Most of these microbes have never been grown in a laboratory. In fact, they can't be grown in a laboratory. They only exist um, in communities with other microbes. Um, and we haven't ever sequenced them, therefore. Um, and the only way we can sequence them is we collect some, say, a scoop of water, um, and we sequence everything that's in that, um, maybe or in a tiny sample of that that we put through the sequencer. Um, but that means that there may be thousands or even millions of individual species in that one sample. That makes it very hard for us to analyze it. The way the sequencers work is they spit out fragments of the DNA. They don't just sort of read out every chromosome for you. So now the problem from a computational standpoint is how do you take these little fragments and actually turn them into long long sequences of DNA from which you can find genes and use them to make um, other, other um, biological discoveries from everything from trying to understand how carbon will be absorbed or released when these microbial communities change amidst, uh, when, during climate, if the climate warms, um, or looking at, I'm trying to design a particular set of species to produce a material or a drug or something like that that you are trying to develop. So it turns out that um, this problem is much harder than the human genome assembly problem. Uh, this is called de novo assembly, which is mean we're, we're assembling it from scratch. Somebody did that for the human genome, and so for most analysis that we do in medicine uh, that involves human DNA, we actually map that these little fragments back to that existing reference, and that's a much easier problem. It's like solving a puzzle where you've got the cover to look at to figure out where each piece is supposed to go. It makes it much easier. In our case, we're looking at a puzzle where we don't have the cover, um, and not only do we not have the cover, but somebody has taken a thousand or a million different puzzles and thrown all the pieces into one big pile. Um, so what you're seeing on the, the graph on the left is a number of different, these are called metagenomes, when the genomes are all mixed together like this, um, some different kinds of metagenome uh, samples, and the percentage that we're actually able to correctly assemble using um, some of the state-of-the-art sort of assembly algorithms, that is, how, uh, what, what fraction of the reads that come out of the sequencer can we actually put together into pieces like a completed puzzle? 
So what we're seeing is for things like soil, which are the bottom here, um, we're under 5 or 10 percent of the, of the puzzle actually gets completed. So a very small fraction of the, uh, of the uh, puzzle actually gets completed. This is actually measuring the number of reads that actually get put into the final assembly. What we need in order to improve this is much larger data sets, so we need to sequence more data, which fortunately the, the, the curve I showed you before will make it easier and easier to collect this, or even these little tiny um, nanopore sequencers that you can uh, use. Um, and collect a lot more data, um, but the problem is then we need a lot of computing because we want to put all this data together. In the environmental science, people also want to collect data over a period of time, um, and I originally thought, um, actually until recently, that each one of those would be assembled separately. But it turns out that you may get a better assembly because it, you just need all of the pieces from all the, the different time points um, by putting them all together. So these create